so yes, this is, this is the symbol we'll be looking at today. This is a Vadra. Uh, and it is actually, if you, I, I think probably most of you have seen one before, but you might not know much about it. And it's quite a fascinating looking object. I don't know if anyone would be able to guess what on earth it was, uh, but it's very, very ubiquitous in Buddhism, especially in Northern Buddhism and Vajrayana Buddhism. So I thought I'd say something about the history of that object and, and what it tells us. Um, in particular, it does symbolize something to do with the splitting of the universe that happens in human consciousness, which starts from that central sphere and then moves out into five prongs in the two directions. Um, as we find ourselves splitting into inside and outside and also into nirvana and the ordinary world. So it's amazing really to start to learn about that sort of thing through a symbol rather than through words. But I'll try and add something to the symbol itself by giving you some words on it. So I'm now going to share the screen and I'll start to show you some uh, images. So there we go, the Vajra. Um, loads and loads of them, but they all look fairly similar, the Buddhist Vajras uh, and a fascinating symbol. Uh, and what the word Vajra means is a lightning bolt uh, or a thunderbolt. Um, and if you imagine, uh, maybe, you, maybe you don't have to imagine, maybe you've been out in a thunderstorm when the lightning is striking, maybe you've been indoors and the, the rain has been pouring down outside and you've heard a huge thunderclap, um, maybe reaching the lightning conductor on your own roof. Um, but if you see that happening in the open air, if you see it happening at sea as well, um, if you see it happening from an aeroplane, uh, the lightning bolts striking, they are very, very impressive. In fact, maybe absolutely terrifying. The amount of energy uh, in one of those bolts of lightning, uh, millions of volts uh, producing uh, a current through ionized air that uh, actually comes up from the ground and goes up into the clouds or that looks looks like the other way around. So it feels like something from the sky is hurling down a destructive bolt of energy. Um, and of course in traditional societies this was seen as something coming uh, not from the sky as a physical uh, mass of gas and clouds but from a being up in the sky, a sky god so that's what people uh, started to associate, the lightning, the lightning bolts for the sky god. And this is the Sanskrit word, Vajra, means the lightning bolt. It also means a diamond. And in people's minds, it seems there was an association uh, between the beautiful, um, fiery, crystalline, pure, clear, and incredibly hard diamond and the lightning bolt. So it's sometimes known as a diamond thunderbolt. So if we go back, we can go back a long, long time in history to find depictions of gods with thunderbolts. Um, it's got one in each hand here. And it's like a bunch of lightning, a bunch of lightning. Uh, this is from Mesopotamia. Another one from Mesopotamia. A different god, but also wielding the lightning and fighting a monster. And then if we go over to Greece, we're probably particularly familiar with Zeus. Uh, Zeus, uh, the Greek king of the gods, the ruler of the gods, and also a thunder god. You can probably already see a similarity between the thunderbolt bunch that he's holding and the metal vantra that I showed you earlier. And here is that's meant to be an eagle on his fist and the eagle is also associated with thunderbolts that one seems to almost have fire pouring up from the center of it and from zeus 
you move to Rome, where Zeus becomes Jupiter, um, classical statue from the Roman Empire of Jupiter holding his bundle of lightning. And in uh, Western modern parlance, we have the sense of God up in the sky, punishing people uh, who disobey him um, or are lacking in reverence uh, or are wicked uh, by chucking a thunderbolt at them. There's a sort of a judgment. And then in uh, European mythology and Norse mythology, we get Thor. Um, I couldn't find any good traditional images of Thor, but of course Thor turns up in modern culture very strongly. And what he holds in his hand is uh, the hammer Mjolnir. And this hammer is the thunder. He's the god of thunder in Norse mythology. And he hurls his thunder and it always returns to his hand. Um, and it's said, uh, this is from one of the Marvel, fil Marvel films, it's said that the hammer of Thor can only be lifted by one who is worthy, a man who is worthy. And so I thought uh, rather tongue in cheek, I title this talk, can the Buddha lift Thor's hammer? And we'll find that the Buddha is worthy. The Buddha is allowed to th lift Thor's hammer, but he uses it for a completely different purpose. He doesn't chuck it at his enemies. Uh, he, I'll say later what he does use it for. And then, so this is Northern Europe. We've seen the Mediterranean, Mesopotamia, but now let's go to India because that's where Buddhism got the Vandra from. And here you'll find that the thunder god is known as Indra or in, in Buddhism sometimes as Chakra or Sukha. Uh, and he rides an elephant, in this case, um, a three-headed elephant. And in his right hand, he wields the Vajra, the thunderbolt. And one legend says that uh, originally Indra's thunderbolt had uh, splayed out sharp prongs, making it a very dangerous thing to be thrown. Um, and the Buddha took the Vajra over from, Indi from Indra, uh, but he bent the prongs inwards, um, presumably out of health and safety concerns, uh, so it's not such a dangerous object, uh, so that it became a symbol of breaking through, more focused, instead of uh, a weapon. And tantric figures who are wrathful sometimes have Vajras with uh, open prongs. This is in Tibetan Buddhism, but normally the Vajra has closed prongs. So it's not intended to uh, damage. However, having said that, we'll see that in early Buddhism, maybe there was a bit of a threat to it. Here's another image of uh, Indra. So there are many legends in the Vedas of Indra fighting against the demons using the Vajra and also legends of the origin of the Vajra, which was made, it said, from the bones of a Rishi, a sage who had done so much uh, intense meditation, tapas, that he, uh, his bones were indestructible forces. So how does it turn up in Buddhism? And so here's uh, from Gandhara, a very early Buddhist image of the Vajra. Um, and the Vajra is being held by the figure, the bearded figure behind the Buddha. The Vajra is the object in his left hand. In his right hand is a fly whisk. Um, and in Gandhara, uh, they adopted uh, Greek, deliberately adopted Greek models for their Buddhist images. And here it's Heracles or Hercules who uh, is the model uh, for the holder of the Vajra. Vajrapani means the Vajra in the hand, the holder of the Vajra. And we'll see more of Vajrapani later. He's a very significant figure. But here he is again, uh, the fly whisk in his right hand, the Vajra in his left hand. Quite a solid looking Vajra. So Vajrapani does turn up in the early Buddhist scriptures uh, and he's particularly um, a protector of truth. So for example, 
there was a time when uh, a disputant called Sachika uh, decided to come and have a debate with the Buddha. He was confident he would win this debate. Sachika means something like Honest John. So he gave himself the name of an upholder of truth. And the Buddha said to him during this uh, conversation they had, well, you're disputing my teachings about non-self. You think that the self is real. You think that the Atman, the soul, uh, is something solid and real within you. And he asked Sachika a question. He said, well, let's have a look at all the different elements of you, of your personality, your body, your feelings, uh, your intentions, uh, your awareness, your consciousness, um, your perceptions, all these different things. Do you have rulership over them? Can you make them do, any of them do exactly what you want? And Sachika refused to answer. And the Buddha asked him three times and said, come on, answer this question. Do you have rulership? Because Sachika knew that his thesis would be severely undermined if he admitted that any of these elements of his, what he thought of as his self, were not actually under his own control. Uh, the body ages and changes, whether we like it or not, it gets ill. And of course, we know that very much at the moment that we're threatened by a virus epidemic uh, and we can't we can't prevent it we can take precautions but we can't prevent it if it gets in and similarly we can't control our feelings we can't control our intentions our perceptions and, and thoughts um, or even our awareness itself as you know if you've tried to meditate so when Sajika refuses to answer the question Vajrapani uh, this figure here uh, the muscular figure of Vajrapani appears brandishing his Vajra over Sachika's head and he says to Sachika if you don't answer I'll split your head with my Vajra and so Sachika uh, gives in and admits no I don't have rulership over my body and my feelings and so on and they're able to continue a very helpful teaching a very helpful for Sachika as well Sachika is very impressed and admits that he was just trying to have a contest but really he's learned something that has made a huge difference to his own life, understanding uh, his identity, understanding what that means. So Vajrapani's function here is to insist on the truth. And sometimes we resist an uncomfortable truth. Sometimes we don't want to know. We don't want even to think about it. Um, and there's a great tension when that happens, when we won't face the truth. And this is symbolized by the destructive power of the Vajra, the sense of the head splitting, a sense of Vajrapani being there saying to us, come on, face it, look into this truth properly. Um, otherwise your head will split open. He's saying, give in, let go, admit it. Uh, and the example of Sachika, that's not the only thing, but the example of Sachika, this belief, yes, I am, uh, there is a core to me. There is something stable that's not influenced by other things. That's the real me. It's very difficult to let go of that view. So the Vajra becomes a prominent symbol in Buddhism, held first of all by Vajrapani, who in a way is a version of Indra protecting the Buddha, um, and then turning up as a symbol in its own right. Um, and this is um, particularly in the Mahayana countries, in northern Buddhism as it's known, but you'll also find it in southern Buddhism. This is uh, uh, King Rama the sixth privy seal in Thailand, and he uses a Vajra as his emblem. You don't see them so often in Thailand and Sri Lanka and the other southern countries. But what you do see uh, very prominently is the Vajra in Tibetan Buddhism. And this is how Vajrapani, the same figure that we saw um, in the guise of Hercules, this is how Vajrapani looks in Tibetan Buddhism, the wrathful form of Vajrapani. And if you look carefully, you can see he's holding the Vajra, this time in his right hand, brandishing it high. He's leaping to the left um, and the flames and his flaming hair are blown to the right. An incredibly dynamic figure. Uh, and it shows how frightening sometimes truth can be, how even destructive, that when we 
face something real, we're suddenly confronted with something real, it can actually feel very frightening indeed and very, very powerful. So imagine if that power of reality was available to us, could be tapped. Imagine how wonderful that would be. Uh, but until that's the case, it can seem threatening and frightening. So this figure is not a negative figure in Tibetan Buddhism, not a demon. He's a bodhisattva. He's one of the main bodhisattvas, one of the great protectors, as he's known, the three protectors, along with the bodhisattva of compassion and the bodhisattva of wisdom. And he's the bodhisattva of energy. So the Vajra that he holds represents energy, the energy that can break through, the energy that can face the truth as well, and the energy that's released by um, allowing the truth, by letting go to reality itself. And then maybe you'll feel like Vajrapani. But it's not just in Tibet uh, that you'll find the Vajra, you'll find it throughout the Northern Buddhist countries. Uh, so here we have the uh, Japanese version of Vajrapani. Uh, Shingon is the Japanese equivalent of Tibetan Buddhism. Uh, and you'll see him, uh, Vajrapani here, holding a rather a long spear-like Vajra, but it's still the Vajra that he's holding in his right hand. His left fist is clenched and he's roaring out his challenge. Uh, he's saying, come on, um, face it, face reality, face the truth. You can do it. Here's the energy. And there's another image um, of Phantropani. From Japan. If you have any questions, by the way, put them in the chat. And Chris is uh, co-hosting today. So I hope he'll spot them. Um, and if he wants to interrupt, he's very welcome to do that. And he can ask the question in the middle of the slideshow while we still remember it. Um, or we can wait until the end uh, and then we can unmute everybody and have a little discussion uh, about these images. But do feel free to put a question in the chat if you want to. And as I say, Chris can either leave it till the end or he can, um, uh, he can mention it to me vocally uh, and I'm very happy to deal with questions. So there's not just Vajrapani, uh, there are many figures who are associated with the Vajra in what's known as Vajrayana Buddhism, uh, the way of the Vajra, one of the big branches of Buddhism that dominates in Tibet. Um, and here we have uh, a less vigorous figure, the figure of the Buddha Akshobhya, the Buddha of the Eastern direction, who's shown with his right hand touching the earth and who's shown just resting a Vajra, instead of brandishing it as if he's about to hurl it, it rests balanced in his palm. He's uh, normally in Tibet blue in color. So the Vajrayana is sometimes known as the esoteric vehicle or the esoteric way in Buddhism, uh, the secret way. And it's also said to be the quick way. It's said to be the quick way to enlightenment. It takes you there fastest. fastest but it does so with a risk. And this is because the way it works is to work directly with one's energy. And with destructive energies like hatred or intense neediness um, or um, pride or envy, all these different things, it says, rather than trying to dampen them down, rather than trying to use your mindfulness to leave them there on one side um, or to stand back from them and just to watch them happening. Why don't you see whether you can transform the energy directly, the energy that's in say that anger and flip over a destructive energy to become a constructive energy, an energy in pursuit of enlightenment. And this is what the Vajra is talking about. And we'll see this later in its detailed symbolism. So with mindfulness, you can gradually reduce the anger. You can let it dissipate, um, not, not by ignoring it, but by just watching it, just being there with it uh, until your mind is quiet enough to really cultivate enlightenment. But with the Vajrayana approach, you keep the energy, but flip its direction. Now, how you do that is very difficult to describe. And I wouldn't even like to say that I'm really uh, au fait with it. But I do use visualization practices and one way in which you can do it 
is to internalize the energies of these Vajra figures by simply visualizing them, by becoming familiar with them, even in a sense by worshiping them. So in that way that your irritation can um, say become irritation at your own ignorance instead of animosity against other people. So you're still, you're using the energy, but it is a dangerous process doing this because you may strengthen the destructive emotions by giving them your attention in the process. And for this reason, it said that you need a close relationship with a teacher, somebody who's taking you through these meditations, taking you through retreats uh, that concentrate on Vajrayana practices. So Akshobhya, as the Buddha with the Vajra, the Buddha of the East, one of the most important of the mythical Buddhas in Buddhism, he represents Vajrayana Buddhism. Uh, and not just him, there's another Buddha um, who's known as Oh, here's another Akshobhya, sorry. This one is at the Vajrasana Retreat Center. It used to be in this pond. It's now got its own little garden. So if you ever go to Vajrasana in Suffolk, the retreat center there, then um, have a look at the Akshobhya there. Um, and there's a, a peaceful version of, of Vajrapani, the Vajrahola, and this one by Vishuddhimati, our very own artist at North Island Buddhist Center. You can see her work and her cards when we reopen the center, which I hope won't be too long. And then as well as Vajrapani, as well as Akshobhya, uh, we have Vajrasattva. I showed this image, I think, in my last slideshow. So you can see the Vajrasattva is holding the Vajra, again, just resting in his palm, but now it's up at heart level and is associated with his heart. And in his heart, he has the seed syllables of energy uh, and of purity um, and nectar flows from those seed syllables and flows down to touch all beings according to the legend. Uh, and this is the way that the Tibetans depict Vajrasattva holding the Vajra to his heart. And another Vajrasattva image that's become very weathered, an old plaster image made also by Aluka. Show a few of his uh, images in this talk. I'll come back to Vajrasattva later on. Vajrasattva means the Vajra being, the being with the Vajra. But there's another important figure in Tibet who also holds a Vajra. And this is Padmasambhava. And Padmasambhava um, was a historical figure, a great Buddhist teacher of the eighth century, uh, who is said to have succeeded at last in establishing Buddhism in Tibet after a number, number of unsuccessful attempts. And he did so because he was able to subdue the local demons. In other words, he was able to enter into the Tibetan mindset, Tibetan culture, Tibetan spirituality. He could see that the previous Indian teachers who'd arrived just tried to teach Buddhism as if it was an Indian religion, but the Tibetans were quite different people and they needed a different approach. Uh, in a way, a more vigorous approach, a more pagan approach, an approach that was based in an awareness of uh, the natural world and the forces of the natural world in a mountainous country filled with thunderstorms and hailstorms, that thunderbolt, that Vajra was absolutely essential uh, for uh, Padmasambhava to wield. So Padmasambhava was the son of a king and himself a royal, effectively royalty in Buddhism, sometimes known as the second Buddha. And you can see that this kingly attribute is connected with the, the Vajra. The Vajra then becomes the scepter of a king, the insignia of a king, as we saw for the king of Thailand. But it's also a diamond. Um, it's also a weapon, as we saw in the hands of Vajrapani or in the hands of Thor and Zeus. And it's also a philosopher's stone. And I mention this in connection with Pandasandra because he unites uh, all of these functions. Uh, the function of the scepter, using the Vajra as a scepter because, of, because he's a king, he's a ruler archetype, 
the diamonds may be associated with the, the lover archetype, uh, which is something that you'll find very strongly in Pamasandra's biography. Uh, the weapon, the warrior archetype, the defeater of demons, the philosopher's stone, um, which transmutes base metals into gold, uh, connected with the magician archetype. And these are four important archetypes in Jungian psychology. Last week we saw on Buddha Day, if you were there, uh, we looked at the four archetypes at the time of the Buddha, uh, the archetype of uh, the shadow, um, the anima, uh, the female archetype of the uh, young hero and uh, the old wise man. But these are also very important archetypes, the king, the lover, uh, the warrior and the magician. So here's Padmasambhava. This is actually a, a real person with a Padmasambhava mask at the London Buddhist Centre a few years back. And this costume and mask uh, were created amongst other people by Chintami, very realistic, with what's known as the lotus hat and the vulture's feather. But there you see Padmasambhava holding, delicately holding the Vajra. So I want to look at the Vajra itself a bit more closely now, now that we've seen some of the figures that hold it. Here's a giant one, uh, bigger than a human being uh, from Nepal. Uh, it makes it a bit easier to see the form of it. So just notice the form, usually five pointed. Uh, the fifth one being the central prong, usually having a sphere at the middle uh, with lotus petals opening out from that sphere. And then you may be able to see there's a strange animal head uh, whose tongue or flames coming out of its mouth uh, produce each of the prongs, the bent back prongs of the Vajra. Sometimes there are only three points in the Vajra, sometimes five. I've seen a six pointed Vajra. And the forms uh, of the Vajra do vary a little. And nine pointed Vajras. Um, and uh, at the end, uh, I hope I'll remember to do this, I'll show you, I've got a nine pointed Vajra here. And this is a very special one because it's the emblem of the North London Buddhist Centre, which when I became the chair of the centre was entrusted to me by the previous chair, the Shudhi um, you know, for safekeeping. So it sits on my shrine uh, representing um, a reminder uh, of the lineage, if you like, of the North London Buddhist Centre. That's a nine-pointed Vajra. This one mentions the name of the animal from which the prong sometimes emanates, Makara, the Makara. I'll say more about the Makara later. Here you can see uh, little human heads around the little human faces around the Vajra. You get sometimes get that. More elaborate Vajra. And the reason for the rings is so that you can make a noise by rattling it uh, during tantric ceremonies. I'll say more about tantric ceremonies in a minute as well. Here are Vajras, two dimensional Vajras depicted on a shrine cloth. Here's a, a Vajra from Mongolia. Look out for those animals again, animal heads. And this one from China. And now back to Japan. The name of the Vajra um, in Japan is the Congo. And another Vajra from a, a shrine in Kyoto. And I won't say much about Japanese Shingon Buddhism, partly because I'm not very familiar with it, but um, Shingon Buddhism is the equivalent of Vajrayana Buddhism. It's the name for Vajrayana Buddhism in Japan. Uh, also sometimes called Mantrayana, uh, the kind of Buddhism that uses mantras. Um, 
and also known as esoteric Buddhism uh, because it has to be transmitted from a teacher to a disciple. Uh, and the Vajra is very important there. And there are two main symbols of Shingon Buddhism, which are known as the two mandalas. Um, one of them is called the womb mandala and the other is called the Vajra mandala. Uh, so there is so-called feminine and masculine symbolism there. And this one is uh, very complex with loads of different Buddhas uh, on the mandala uh, and also um, Vajras as well, which you can't see very clearly in this, but uh, this is the Vajra mandala. Congo Kai. And we also have Vajra swords. And in fact, we have a number of implements where there is a Vajra on one side. Instead of being a full Vajra uh, going in both directions, we have one side of a Vajra and the other side uh, is, in this case, uh, a single Markara's head uh, whose tongue or flames become a flaming sword. And this is the sword of wisdom. So Manjushri, the Bodhisattva of wisdom, wields this sword, uh, which is not intended to hurt people. It's intended to be um, a fine divider, a fine discriminator uh, of wisdom. And we also sometimes get double Vajras, uh, the, Vish, the Vishva Vajra. Um, and this has its own special symbolism. Um, in particular, there's an old legend that says that um, in the time before the solar system condensed, before this planet formed, uh, the universe or the galaxy was what they call a fire mist. And in this fire mist, two winds started to blow, two currents started to form, and the currents were going in opposite directions, and they formed a crossed Vajra. In other words, they formed, as it were, two lightning bolts uh, that were crossing, each of them irresistible, but each of them um, penetrating the other. And that became the foundation, it said, uh, for our world. Um, it became sort of the foundation stone for the world, the double Vajra. And upon it rested what was known as the Vajra seat, the Vajrasana. And so the legend says that this spot on our world is Bodh Gaya, is the place where the Buddha gained enlightenment. And it said all the Buddhas of the past and all the Buddhas of the future will also gain enlightenment on the Vajra seat. And that Vajra seat in turn rests upon the double Vajra, the double Vajra of universal strength and stability, stability that contains a huge amount of energy. So it's obviously not literally uh, that uh, the center of the universe is the place of the Buddha's enlightenment, but symbolically the place of enlightenment, the place where awareness gains its complete fruition is a central spot in our myths and, uh, and in our imaginations. And that spot is underlain by the double Vandra. And here are there's a variety of double Vandras. Um, the, these pages are from a book by Robert Beer, who's a, a great American Tibetan artist. He's actually American, but he's, he, he specializes in Tibetan symbolism and he's done a great study of it and all the variations that you can find um, uh, of Vandras and double Vandras in Tibet, amongst other things. And another uh, implement that we have, very important implement that we have uh, with a Vajra at one end uh, and not at the other end is the Vajra bell. And the Vajra bell um, has, yes, that's the standard Vajra coming out in one direction, but below the Vajra you'll see a woman's face and that's the face of perfect wisdom, Pranya Paramita, uh, the Buddha, the female Buddha associated with perfect wisdom. Um, and her body becomes, uh, in this symbolism, uh, the bell itself, and the bell that's used in tantric ritual. Uh, the bell is surrounded by uh, seed syllables representing mantras and by a whole ring of vajras around the bottom. 
And here's a, a drawing of it so that you can see that. The mantra around the bottom has eight syllables and I'm afraid I don't know uh, Tibetan script well enough to know what they are. Um, so I'm not sure if this is a single mantra or whether it's um, uh, seed syllables associated with different Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. So that's the Vajra bell. Um, and here you can see uh, the Vajra and the bell uh, being used in a ritual context. Um, again, I'll show you uh, a bell at the end, but so you can hear one before I go back. This is the sound of the Vantra bell. So in the right hand, uh, the ritual master, uh, the Lama, will hold um, uh, a vajra and in the left hand a bell uh, and during the ritual during the puja during chanting uh, during the various evocation of padmasambhava or of akshobhya padrasattva and so on um, there are lots of different movements beautiful dancing hand movements with the right and the left hand sometimes ringing the bell sometimes gracefully uh, brandishing the vajra uh, and then going back into the chanting. So a very, very beautiful Tibetan ritual, very, very beautiful indeed. Uh, and the Vajra is absolutely central to that ritual. Now, I mentioned the Vajrasana and I just wanted to show you uh, an image here of a Buddha. And this is an unusual Buddha. This is in the Victorian Albert Museum, I think. Unfortunately, badly damaged, but a very beautiful sculpture. And if you look carefully, you'll see a Vandra lying in front of the Buddha uh, to remind us that the Buddha, at the time of his enlightenment, he's touching the earth with his right hand. At the time of his enlightenment, uh, he was seated on the Vandra throne, the Vandra seat place of enlightenment which is also symbolically speaking the navel of the universe i think the sanskrit is nadi so the navel of the universe is said to be uh, the vajrasana the vandra seat now let's look now i hope you're bearing up uh, at the symbolism of the vajra itself the structure of the vajra and how it represents uh, the division of the world and how it represents the possibility of reconciling that division by transforming destructive energies into constructive energies. So the first thing to notice is that uh, in the left hand uh, image, you can see the central sphere or circle. And in this case, the circle contains uh, a coil of joy as it's called. So this circle or sphere at the center uh, is primordial unity, or to put it differently, it's basic awareness it's the awareness that we all have access to that is there all the time, the illumination that's there all the time that hasn't yet divided the world into what's me and is inside and what is other as object and is outside. So it's an undivided, pure awareness itself, which is said to be always there, always accessible. Uh, it is enlightenment, but it's enlightenment that we already, in, in a sense, have, uh, but uh, in a way, through our creativity, you could say, something has burst out of that enlightenment and it bursts out in opposite directions. It splits, inevitably it splits. It splits initially into subject and object, and then it splits into oneself and the whole objective world. And then it also splits into nirvana and sangsara. In other words, it splits into the idea of perfection, of freedom, of enlightenment, and the idea of uh, the circular wheel of life, things going round and round, repeating themselves habitually, and all the problems that we create through that wheel of life. But the amazing thing in the Vajra is that the two ends that the universe, that the primordial unity splits into, look identical to each other. They haven't made it into 
uh, you know, a beautiful mandala on one side and a frightening wheel of life on the other side. They said, no, it just divides in this way. And the division becomes fivefold. So first of all, the creativity, the um, organic productivity of this is symbolized by the two lotus blossoms. There's also symbolism in the number of rings, by the way, the number of rings there are in between things, but I'm not going to go into that. And then from the lotus blossoms emerge four heads on each side uh, of Makaras. So I'll say a little bit about the Makara, which is a very mysterious creature. Uh, again, found in Buddhist art all over the Buddhist world. Um, so you can see a Makara. The Makara is the one whose jaws are open and uh, I'm not sure whether he's eating some uh, other being or the other being is coming out of his jaws. Uh, he's got claws. Uh, in this case, he's got a rider uh, and he's got a long tail with a scaly back. It's a bit more difficult to see the one on the left, but um, the protrusion going to the left is the tongue of the Makara. His jaws are open and he's got big hippopotamus style teeth, big bulging eyes. Here's uh, Laotian ones. Now there's a little clue next to un or underneath the right hand marker here, which is the fish, which tells us that the marker lives in the ocean. And this is a marker with another marker coming out of his mouth. Both fierce and rather comical. And here's a papier-mâché mask of a marker. Um, and you can see sometimes the marker has the horns of a ram and it always has a little trunk, like a small elephant's trunk, and it has tusks in its mouth. And it lives in the ocean um, and it forms the basis of the Vandra. So the marker is a very mysterious symbol, but my impression is that it's and the main point of it is that it's amphibious. It can come out of the ocean and dwell on the land as well. And it's something like a crocodile, a hybrid beast, a crocodile with an elephant's trunk. Uh, in fact, there is an old legend that says at the time of the Enlightenment, animals who'd once been enemies uh, united, became friends and even became mates, and they produced hybrid offspring. And possibly two of those were the crocodile and the elephant and the hybrid offspring of the crocodile and the elephant was the marker. So then let's have a look at the, the five prongs. And these five prongs, um, they symbolize on one side, uh, the sangsara, uh, the problematic uh, ego-driven life. And on the other side, they symbolize the nirvana, uh, the freedom, the life of freedom uh, freedom from negative emotion, from destructive emotions, and so on. And you can use lots and lots of groups of five to represent these. For example, the five Buddhas that transform into the five skandhas, the five heaps of the human personality. And then the five skandhas transform back into the five Buddhas so that we can transform our ordinary mundane personality into the personality of a Buddha. Uh, but in particularly interesting is the transformation of the five wisdoms, um, uh, which are formed from the five poisons. So the five poisons are hatred, pride, craving, envy, and is ignorance. So hatred is said to transform into the mirror-like wisdom that just see things, sees things exactly as they are. In a way, the cold light that comes from hatred can also be a mirror-like light that accepts the reality of everything, frightening that may be. And then the poison of pride, uh, where you think uh, you, you want the best for yourself and you think you're the best, you're the greatest, or even where you think you're the worst, but where you think of yourself all the time, becomes the wisdom of equality, where you see the wonderful uh, worth, uh, the equal worth, the equal value of everybody. And then the uh, poison of craving, transforms into the discriminating wisdom. The craving is the wisdom, uh, is, sorry, is the poison that uh, is always lacking, always needs something. 
uh, always feels it's not complete. And instead of that, uh, you rejoice with a discriminating wisdom in the wonderful uniqueness of everybody else, including yourself. And then envy transforms into the all performing wisdom. The envy that freezes you, that makes you wish you were somebody else or wish you were better or uh, think it's not fair that somebody else is getting all the, uh, the attention that transforms into the active wisdom, the wisdom that engages compassionately with the world. So instead of envy, you just say, you just get on with it. You get on with whatever cont contribution that you can make. And then fi finally, the central prong is uh, the poison of ignorance in one direction, and that transforms in the other direction into the wisdom of the sphere of reality and takes us back into the very center, the sphere of reality itself. Uh, the Jnana Dhatu. So there's a little uh, hint about the symbolism of the Vajra. And if you want to know more about it, there's a lovely little book called The Vajra and the Bell by Vasantra, published by Windhorse Publications, The Vajra and the Bell. And he goes into the symbolism of Vajra and also uh, of the bell as well. So one end of the Vajra is the ordinary world. The other is the Vajra world. And at first, the five poisons look the same as the five wisdoms until we can see that we can transform um, the energy of the poisons into the energy of the wisdoms. The Vajra is about the transformation of energy so that it becomes free energy, awakened energy, um, compassionate energy, skillful energy. So this is the Vajra as the philosopher's stone, as the thing that transmutes base metals into gold, symbolically speaking. Um, so I'm going to finish in a minute, but I just want to go back in a way to the emotional side of the Vajra, the sense of holding the Vajra to the heart, uh, which Vajra Sattva, who we saw earlier, does. And this symbolizes this attempt to transform the destructive emotions into constructive emotions, holding the Vajra to your heart, being heart-based, being body-based, coming from the very center of your being, not just coming from behind your eyes, but come from your emotion center and saying that in that emotional center, destructive emotions sometimes arise, but they don't have to. And those destructive emotions can become uh, beautiful, loving, constructive emotions. So I've got a little close up here of the weathered statue of Alaka's Vajra Sattva, holding the Vajra, sincerely, devotedly, full of energy, holding that, the Vajra to his heart. So I'll stop the sharing there. Um, uh, and let's unmute everybody in case you want to come in but well, before i unmute you i'll just um, i promise to show you first of all the nine pointed vajra yeah. this is the nine pointed vajra which is the emblem of the north london buddhist center so a very very precious vajra that's been handed down um, for, uh, from one chair of the center to another which i'm now looking after very honored to look after and it sits there on my on my buddha uh, Rupa. Um, and here's the uh, the Vajra bell.